In this roundup of a week, Extinction Rebellion ponders a new strategy of accidental leftism as it struggles with a fall off in numbers and enthusiasm of supporters. A new paper pushes against the use of the IPCC's worst case scenario, even as McKinsey put out a report based on it. And we get yet another glimpse of cancel culture as Alistair Stewart OBE gets fired for quoting Shakespeare. My name's Malin Baker. This is The Malin Baker Show for Changemakers. In the UK, today is Brexit Day. At 11pm tonight, it becomes official. There will be celebrations across the land with some people and wailing and gnashing of teeth with other people. And tomorrow, the sun will rise as normal and the world will be much the same, except a whole bunch of people are going to have shocking hangovers. Fun times. While all that's going on, there's this. You might have noticed that things have been relatively quiet on the Extinction Rebellion front during the first part of 2020. In a previous video, I said that I thought the group would struggle from this point onwards as it was following a strategy that required ever greater numbers of people on the streets to succeed. But it was likely to find that it lacked the momentum to do this and particularly after some pretty mixed results during its last big action last year. Sure enough, Rupert Reid has joined with a couple of others to put out a public discussion document that lays bare some of the soul searching that the group is going through as it tries to work out where it can go next. By the way, do I think it'd be a bad thing if we had an effective environmental grassroots movement? Absolutely not. It really has a place, can be useful. But this one, based as it has been on exaggerating the science and aiming to overthrow democratic processes, you know, I don't think it looks like this. Anyway, in the pamphlet, Rushing the Emergency, Rushing the Rebellion, Rupert and his friends Mark Lopatin and Skeena Raffel put forward their ideas. They said that they needed a new story, one based on how vulnerable we all are, to be more successful in winning the wider groups of the cause. And it's a remarkable mix of well thought through and informed tactics on how to go about emotionally manipulating people matched with hilariously huge lack of insight on the kind of messages that might play with people who don't share their world view. What follows, therefore, is intended as a departure from recent high profile and overly polarising tactics such as Exile co-founder Roger Hallam's leveraging of the Holocaust with mainstream media and the Canning Town tube action of last October. Gee, polarising tactics. If only someone had been there to point out early on that that was the case. Still, no one could have known. Instead, the CEE, CEE stands for Climate Emergency something, becomes a universal lens for exacerbating everyday vulnerabilities felt by people in relation to their gender, age, ethnicity and class. Rooting the story in contemporary vulnerability helps to connect the future with now. If you think that sounds like a setup for diving into the new left intersectionality where people are addressed as though which oppressed groups they're members of are the most important things about them, then you may be right. In a section headed Disrupting the Story, they say this, and yet climate scientists have expected it, it being the story, to peacefully deliver on the following. Over one billion people living across the minority world must accept a new normal for living. Not entirely clear what they mean by that, but the second clause is the kicker. Over six billion people living across the majority world make peace with an aspiration to one day live like the minority world. What? I mean, what? First of all, I think most climate scientists would prefer that Rupert Reed et al. didn't presume to speak on behalf of them if those are the words they're going to put in their mouths. If you thought that the accusations made by people, including me, that key figures in the movement wanted to slam the brakes on for human development and throw backwards decades of progress, that's the expression of that idea right there. The idea that it might be an alternative vision that people would aspire to doesn't seem to be acknowledged at all. And that's because they assume that the metaphorical and probably literal deluge is sweeping towards us right now. The rich elites may be building their bunkers and planning their escape route to Mars, but it won't do them any good. In the shorter term, there will be chaos and misery on an unimaginable scale as the most vulnerable people on the planet will not dutifully stay and wither. 
The global food system, for example, already fails to properly nourish billions of people and leaves upwards 800 million hungry. What they fail to mention is that absolute poverty and hunger have been halved over recent decades, even as the population has doubled. What they fail also to detail is how you could slam the brakes on human development to get those 6 billion into the lifestyle currently associated with the bottom 1 billion without massively increasing poverty and hunger. This is the standard rhetoric, of course, and they admit that it has stopped working for them. We would go so far as to say rising awareness of the climate and ecological emergency might actually be shrinking XRUK's ability to cut through post-April 2019. This was the takeaway message of polling compiled for XRUK, while anecdotal evidence suggests action attendance numbers are down and that coordinators are finding it hard to motivate their groups. In a separate section, they went into more detail. Some of the above played out in October 2019. Numbers of arrests were up, but this didn't cause greater success. In fact, success was clearly lower than in April. XR's own YouGov polling clearly shows this, with XR's own popularity falling to 5%, as also shown by the level of donations, email signups, Facebook likes, etc. Indeed, diminishing returns. As I said in my earliest video on this, such messages will only motivate the base. It's why the anti-nuclear weapons movement a number of decades ago, after 10 years of doing the same sort of thing, stopped showing mushroom clan pictures. Although by then it was too late to reinvent the message for that campaign. And that's kind of XR's problem now. They have already got a very well-defined image it's not working for them, nor the cause that they claim to espouse. Changing it at this stage, probably next to impossible, but they're giving it a try. They've got input from Professor Andre Spicer at Cass Business School, who also got input from people described as world leaders in research on communications by social movements. And Spicer said this, This message of vulnerability has some important strengths. It triggers loss aversion a strong cognitive bias which tends to drive people to engage in more risky behaviour. It makes an abstract issue into a real issue through forefronting everyday issues like feeding a family. It brings the threats posed by climate change into the immediate time frame, five to ten years, which means they cannot be easily discounted away by people. So, once you've made people feel vulnerable about this, what happens then? Experiences of vulnerability are used as a first step to get people to accept a new group or set of values. For instance, when recruits are socialised into a group, they're made to feel vulnerable by having their prior identity stripped away. However, this is usually followed up by them being given a new identity through joining a group. This helps to make them feel less vulnerable. That is a scarily close description of how people get inducted into actual cults. Stripping away someone's prior identity, giving them a new identity through the group, and hence giving them meaning and security. Yuck. If you can't see how that hovers on the edge of evil, I don't know what to say to you. In terms of areas of focus, they suggest focusing on just-in-time supply chain systems, with the idea that just a little disruption can mean that suddenly there won't be food for people to feed their families. In addition, they want to stick it to the rich elites, who they say are all to blame for this. And if they can only get that message over better, then the workers will begin to see them as being their champions and will join them in rising up. Or something. And if that sounds just like traditional radical leftism to you, once again, you might be right. In his recent interview, which I mentioned in last week's video, Rupert Reid says that the movement might end up there is that one of the main arguments is used against the Extinction Rebellion approach is, but you're going to make us have these kind of miserable lives, we're going to have to give everything up, etc. Right? I want to kind of turn that around and say, actually, I don't see why it, needs, why it needs to be that way. I think that actually it's likely to work out the very opposite way, that actually we're going to make everybody uh, happier. I think it is going to turn out, right, that many of the policies we need to bring in, many of the policies that the Citizens' Assembly would bring in under our third mm. demand, would coincide with a left-wing agenda. But it would be a coincidence. It would not be the reason why we bring those in. We wouldn't be bringing those in because we have any kind of dogmatic commitment to a more equal society. We'd be bringing them in because they're necessary. Right. Sort of accidental leftism. 
Because if you follow the science, then obviously we have to end up overthrowing the elites and establishing socialism. It's not politics, guys. It's just the science. I mean, we don't really want to do this. And they reinforce the point in their document. If the polluter elite go on as they are, then it's curtains for humanity. This is not ideology. It is plain and simple fact. This is what the somewhat misleading slogan beyond politics really means, that very radical action is now needed in order to enable us to hold on to any of what we have got. That action will involve the creation of a more equal society, not for reasons of ideology, but for reasons of survival. Obviously, accidental non-ideological leftism, totally different to the standard kind, because, you know, because... Not everyone's convinced by this. For instance, this commenter on a discussion about the fact that founder Roger Hallam seems to have upset more XR people, this time in Switzerland, who says it's far left political ideology that's losing as people, not Roger Hallam. Well, to be fair, they sort of come hand in hand. But anyway, that's enough of that. But it's an interesting insight into the struggle for the heart and soul of the movement. People who jumped on me when I did the first couple of videos on Extinction Rebellion won't remember that what they were castigating me for was predicting much of the dilemma that they now have. The only thing, thankfully, that hasn't happened yet that I predicted is the emergence of a more radical group that follows the logic to its natural conclusion and decides to abandon the non-violence bit. I would be very happy to be proved wrong on that one. On to other news. While XR predicts catastrophe and people dying like flies unless they embrace accidental leftism, the pushback against the extreme IPCC scenario RCP 8.5 went up a gear with a comment piece in Nature calling for it to be dropped. RCP 8.5 was intended to explore an unlikely high-risk future, but it has been widely used by some experts, policymakers and the media as something else entirely, as a likely business-as-usual outcome. Now, I've said this here before, of course, and the first time I observed that there was a gathering backlash, even though I quoted one of Extinction Rebellion's favourite campaigning scientists, I got plenty of kickback from people suggesting that I was basically angling to be personally responsible for the death of the planet or something. But the movement is continuing to gain momentum and this must surely start to affect how the discussion is carried on because it's needed. Only last week, for instance, we saw yet another contribution to the debate based on the extreme scenario. This time from top management consultants McKinsey, who launched a report on climate risk and response. So, talking to their clients about how they should be managing risk. And they framed it like this. How could Earth's changing climate impact socioeconomic systems across the world in the next three decades. A year-long cross-disciplinary research effort at McKinsey & Company provides some answers. Now that sounds authoritative. Big, respected firm like McKinsey, a year-long cross-disciplinary effort. As average temperatures rise, climate science finds that acute hazards such as heat waves and floods grow in frequency and severity and chronic hazards such as drought and rising sea levels intensify exhibit one this is exhibit one up to five degrees celsius by 2050 and then you see the legend increase in average temperature based on rcp 8.5 so a year-long research effort by a highly respected global consultant that used data from a scenario considered basically impossibly above what we actually expect to see happen but I'm kind of guessing that their clients don't know that. And that's why the comment piece in Nature, along with all of the other correctives, are absolutely required. Because people who should know better don't know better. And the debate on what we should do next is being polluted by bad data. And even if you point it out on a wholly science-supported and factual basis, there is every likelihood that someone, possibly up to and including the BBC, but certainly the campaigners, will kick back and call you an anti-science denier. Ironically, earlier today, Extinction Rebellion staged a protest outside McKinsey, demanding that the consulting firm, quote, use its influence over companies and governments to drive far-reaching action on climate change. 
There you go, McKinsey. Even when you use the unsupportably worst case scenario in your advice to companies, you still won't be supported by the campaigners because it will never be enough. And that's sort of why I focused on the issue of free speech a couple of weeks ago, because it could all too easily end up where we have already gotten to when it comes to discussions of race and gender, for instance. A case in point. This week, respected broadcaster of 40 years standing, Alistair Stewart, OBE, has been fired from his job over a tweet. Several times, Stewart had had Twitter arguments with people that ended with him quoting Shakespeare. But man, a proud man, dressed in a little brief authority, most ignorant of what he's most assured, his glassy essence, like an angry ape, plays such fantastic tricks before high heaven as makes the angels weep who with our spleens would all themselves laugh mortal. Hashtag Shakespeare. I have no idea what that means in the context of a tweet. It seems to be an especially pretentious way of saying that you have no idea what you're talking about. But it could just be that I have no idea what I'm talking about when I say that. Either way, not in itself grounds for dismissal, you'd think. It's a quote he's used before in a discussion with an, a white environmentalist, which I dare say was kind of irritating, but if you don't want any irritating discussions, don't go on Twitter. But in this case, he did it again, and on this occasion, the other person, one Martin Shapland, was black and decided that the reference to an angry ape was a reference to him specifically. And so he replied saying as much and tagging Stuart's employer as he did so. Just an ITV newsreader referring to me as an ape with a cover of Shakespeare. Measure for measure, Alistair is a disgrace. Now, several things can be true at once. Alistair Stewart's colleagues all lined up to say that they were devastated, that this man didn't have a racist bone in his body, had been an enormous support to all of the younger people he worked with, regardless of their ethnicity, and that this was demonstrably unfair. And other colleagues, such as veteran interviewer Andrew Neal, likewise tweeted their support. At the same time, a smaller number of others on Twitter, who had been involved with broadcasting in some way, had a few less complimentary things to say, generally on the grounds that he'd criticised a project of theirs. So, for instance, this one by Luke Jones, who said... When the Radio 4 programme I used to do was cancelled, he kindly told me how shite it slash I was. Or Asma Mir, who said he was not a fan of me on Saturday Live and used to tweet about it. That was fun. Hey ho. Well, OK, a normal human being then. Some people loved him, some people didn't. It was also reported that the argument between Stuart and his latest opponent went beyond just one tweet. All of the other tweets have been deleted since. No archive copies seem to have emerged. None of which wholly distracts from the fact that it was this specific tweet that really did for him. And as we've seen before, in any of these Twitter spats, the thing that gets you fired the quickest is an accusation of an ism or a phobe. Chaplin said that he never wanted Stuart to get fired, that an apology would have been quite enough for him. When you've specifically gone out your way to tag someone's employer, given the sort of way that Twitter cancel culture works, let's just say there's enough grounds to be sceptical of that claim. The question is, at what point do employers stop dropping people, regardless of their career and their track record, just because someone gets hot under the collar on Twitter? I mean, seriously, you've created a world where there is a highly motivated brand of activists just trying out their superpowers to call people out, often for trifling offences, and see how much their life and career can be destroyed as a result. If you hand people that sort of casual power, you've basically created power without responsibility. Should Alistair Stewart be held accountable for what he says on Twitter? Absolutely. Of course he should. We're all responsible for our own actions. Should an employer be firing people at first glance for a Twitter infraction based on the sort of outrage culture that we now have? Not by any means. And if there were other reasons, then they should be specific. Because right now, this simply sends the message to all of their journalists and all of their broadcasters that if you annoy someone who can use anything that you said as an excuse for some mock outrage, and there's always something that can be used, then we will throw you under the bus. 
And that has a chilling effect on free reporting and free discussion, which is exactly what some of those activists are hoping for. And before you know it, you're scared to say anything, because even dictionaries are policing this now. Dictionary.com published a post this week about phrases that you shouldn't say in 2020. These included spirit animal. People say such and such is my spirit animal to suggest that they have a deep affinity with it. Bad, because that's part of the belief system of certain cultures and that's cultural appropriation. Sherpa. Don't refer to anyone as a Sherpa unless they're Nepalese or Tibetan and helping guide you up a mountain. It's just disrespectful. Although I have to say that the Sherpas who once led me up to Annapurna base camp in Nepal would have laughed hysterically at the idea. But hey, what do they know? Guru. Don't call yourself or anyone else a guru. Bad. A ninja. Unless you're actually a Japanese ninja. And so on and so on. You get the general idea. When random university social science professors say such things, we can shake our heads and chuckle or maybe roll our eyes and despair for the hope of young people in the education system. But a dictionary? Policing what language you can and can't use? No, sorry. We're entering a phase when people are scared to say things today that everybody knew to be true until yesterday. How can we expect to find our way through any of the complex problems and debates that we have as a society if that becomes the norm of our discourse? It's just bewildering. And when I said, when I introduced this item, we could easily end up in a similar place when it comes to the discussion of climate science. Remember Rupert's strategy document for XR about aligning the agenda around vulnerability to people based on their ethnicity, gender, class, etc. Exactly the intersectional power game. Exactly the sort of thing they'd love to have working for them. The term racist and the term denier are both terms that can be used to cancel people, to shut them down and to prevent the discussion of genuinely difficult issues that need to be discussed. And there are lots of parallels. Because there are genuine racists out there who will put forward some vile and hateful stuff. But the way the label's now used goes way beyond anything that's connected with that to become a vehicle of power against others who are innocent of wrongdoing. And in the same way, there have been people working for corporate interests who deliberately and maliciously seek to sow confusion in a scientific area purely because of the business benefits if action are not taken. But as the use of the label gets more and more lazy and it gets used on anybody who doesn't support the orthodoxy and then increasingly the orthodoxy itself gets stretched by campaigners to be less and less anchored on the actual science, well, you get the general idea. Calling people names, whatever they are, are the opposite of reasoned debate. If you feel the need to call someone a phobe or an ist or a denier or an alarmist, then you're conceding that you don't have the better arguments so you're just attacking the person. Every time you do it, you lose the argument. And that's it for this week. Next week's News Roundup will be recorded in a non-EU country. So obviously it will be very different to this one. My name is Malin Baker. This is The Malin Baker Show.